it's fun to roll dice. Broadly speaking, that tends to be correct. There's a guarantee in rolling dice. You're either going to be happy because you get what you want, or else you're going to be surprised. We humans like getting what we want, but we also like to be surprised. It seems like a winning formula, but there are five important hidden costs to dice rolls that I think game designers ought to keep in mind. One, dice rules and mental cycles. Every dice roll has a rule associated with it. You don't just roll dice to roll dice. You roll a die, and then you do something based on the result. Every die roll represents at least a binary condition, but because there are lots of sides on most popular forms of dice, there are probably more than just two results. When you tell a player to roll a die, you're generally asking the player to recall a rule set governing how the game proceeds based on the dice result. Back in the battle days of traditional board games, the rule was probably roll a six-sided dice and then move your player token that number of spaces along the path. That led to some, I think, pretty unspectacular and kind of boring board game designs, but you have to admit that's pretty easy to remember. Roll the dice and move your token and do the thing that the board tells you to do. Modern games, on the other hand, can get pretty complex, so very often there's a different rule set governing different kinds of dice rolls. Roll this die and add this number for combat. Roll that die and add that number for defense. Roll this other die and add something else for a skill check and so on, and that's assuming the player is only playing one or two games during the course of their life. It can get to the point that players dread picking up dice if they've played too many systems and have too many different rules trying to vie for their attention. So what's the, the lesson slash solution here? Well, I think consistency is key. D&D 5e, or its unofficial successor, Tales of the Valiant, is pretty famously a simple role-playing game, and one of the ways that it makes it so simple is that it is relatively consistent with how you roll dice. You roll a d20 almost for everything, and you add a value from your attribute scores rather than adding say, a specific uh, score for a skill. Unless you have a proficiency, then you add that as well. I, I, even that, as simple as that is, and I do believe that that's pretty simple, I've seen that confuse people. New players, they, they roll the d20 and they just don't remember what numbers they're supposed to add, to say nothing of the confusion that comes with rolling for damage from their weapon. Now they have to pick up a different kind of dice. So obviously that's not a perfect example of a perfect system, it's just a good example of just how simple things really do need to be for players to stop having to think about the system that they're playing. Two, strategy. Some games are all about strategy. A player is provided resources and must spend those resources to outsmart another player or the game engine. And the exciting element in that kind of game is a set of known factors. It's a puzzle that needs solving. Dice rolls are never known factors. Randomness is the point of a dice roll. A dice roll brings the unexpected into a game, and that can be frustrating for a player who thinks the game is about strategy. In the mostly defunct Magic the Gathering game, there was a set developed as a tie-in to the mostly defunct Dungeons & Dragons universe, and it introduced dice rolls to some of the cards. There had been dice rolls in some of the unsets before, but the pretense of unsets is that the gameplay is intentionally silly. But in the D&D set of Magic the Gathering, a card requiring a dice roll made the card almost useless, because after all, the very definition of what the card could do was variable. Magic the Gathering has a catalog of over 25,000 cards, so why would you ever use a card that might do a thing when you can almost certainly find a different card that definitely does a thing. To offset this frustration, the dice rolls never worked against you, and that was a conscious choice that the design team made. And the theory there was that you only ever stood to benefit from the roll, but that meant that a card with a dice roll was only sort of valued, in games terms, as its lowest effect. Because a, a smart player doesn't bank 
on a roll of the dice. On the contrary, a common strategy in Magic the Gathering deck building is to reduce variables by including the maximum number of the same cards in a deck. You can only have four of the same cards, so most of the tournament winning decks you see are just a bunch of sets of four of the same cards. You, you would be surprised at how many winning deck lists are really, really short because they include four copies of literally every card in the deck so the player is drawing known factors. Dice rolls and strategy aren't entirely at odds though. Wargaming and RPG, they can be extremely strategic and there are lots of variables that they have that something like, for instance, Magic the Gathering just can't, but players of those games tend to value and plan on surprise. A recognized part of the game experience is to deal with blocked attacks, counter-attacks, attacks of opportunity, near misses, unexpectedly powerful hits, and all manner of unforeseeable circumstances, so players typically factor that in. So what's the lesson here? I think you need to be careful of what you randomize. Select your randomization carefully, and that's for both games masters of RPGs and players of war games, and, and obviously players of Magic the Gathering. Three, pacing. Rolling dice can have an effect on a game's pace. In many war games, there are defense rolls that verify the effectiveness of a hit. That makes at least two rolls, one for each player, for every troop attack. One player rolls dice to make the attack, and then the other player rolls dice to confirm that the hit was damaging to them, and then maybe there's a third roll to establish just how much damage was dealt, and so on. I mean, it could be three or four or two rolls for the most important action of the game that you keep doing. That's an expensive roll that functionally presses pause on what could be potentially a very exciting moment in the game. Imagine that. You you move in for an attack. Your squad fires 15 dice worth of artillery. You get nine hits. That's exciting. Except now, stop. Now pass control of the game to your opponent. Wait for them to roll their dodges or their defenses. And your opponent shrugs off two hits, so your nine is now a seven, but now you have to roll again to see just how much damage you actually dealt, and now it's down from seven, maybe more like five or four. It's not a crushing blow to the pace of the game, and a lot of players of games, they factor that into the experience. It's part of the fun, and for cinematic war, I think that's rather realistic because people have armor and, and, and arrows or bullets or lasers that bounces right off of armor, doesn't it? What's the lesson here? I think the lesson is to count how many dice rolls are required in the main loop of your game and just factor that in. If your audience expects a bunch of dice rolls, then maybe that's not a problem. But if there's some other component to the game and a dice roll could be seen as a way to slow the pace of the game down, then maybe you want to combine some dice rolls together or maybe you want to roll those dice in advance so that the moments where they take effect can play out fluidly. Four, barriers. Gamers love to game and the problem uh, with air quotes, is that gamers can find games in unexpected places. If you've got a dice roll set up as a barrier to a thing a player wants, then to some players, that's an invitation to find a way around rolling dice. And that is fair play. Gaming is all about finding a creative solution to a problem. If you've got dice set up to determine the speed of running toward a finish line, you're effectively broadcasting to players that running is a gamble. Now, some players are happy to gamble, but other players take it as an invitation to avoid running. Maybe they'll figure out a way to get the finish line closer to them or to teleport past the finish line or maybe they'll walk across the field instead of running around the track. Whatever their solution is, some players excel and delight in finding the way around the process that you think is of their otherwise obvious. When you roll dice, you feel like you have agency. You're taking your fate into your own hands by, well, surrendering your fate to chance. Okay, it doesn't make all that much sense, but something doesn't have to make sense to be true. Sometimes as a game designer, you use dice because you want to communicate to the player that there's a barrier. Success depends on a dice roll. Just if you do that, you have to be prepared for players to potentially try to avoid dice rolls, especially when there can be negative results from a bad roll. What's the lesson here? Well, the lesson is that, that rolling dice is a communication. It is a message to your players that there's a chance for a hack. There's a chance f to game the system. You need to be okay with that, you need to expect it, and you need to factor it into your game. In Blackstone Fortress, there's a challenge in which player characters 
have a chance to acquire some rewards by rolling dice. However, a failed roll results in one point of damage. I think the designers understood that the potential damage would cause some players to essentially opt out of the challenge altogether, and the mechanic successfully makes it an intriguing individual risk in an otherwise cooperative game. 5. Manipulating Probability A sometimes underrated source of pseudo-randomness is a card deck. When a player rolls dice, probability takes over. It's possible for a player to roll six ones in a row. If you're designing a game where one is the absolute worst result, then your game also needs to be prepared for the possibility of lots of failure. More importantly, your players need to be prepared for failure, and they aren't always willing to endure that. Games like Pandemic, Reign of Cthulhu, or Forbidden Island, or Pathfinder Adventure Card Game, and Battle in Balin's Tomb, they use a shuffled deck to impose penalties. To increase the probability of a bad event, cards are either stacked in some portion of the deck, or they're placed back on the top of the deck under certain circumstances to increase the likelihood of them being drawn. A deck of cards cycles through conditions in a surprising, yet ultimately evenly distributed way. If you have a deck of six cards, numbered one to six, then you know you're only going to get one once out of every six draws. It's not just improbable, it's, it's like impossible to draw six ones. What's the lesson here? Well, dice aren't the only tool that you have in your toolkit. You can use other modes of randomness or of consequence delivery, and sometimes it's, it's a really good thing to do. Rolling dice is fun, but there is a cost. Sometimes the cost may be acceptable to you as a designer, other times it helps to consider fewer rolls or alternatives to dice altogether. Playtest your game, find out whether you're accidentally designing a Yahtzee clone or whether you're designing something fun. I mean, some people like Yahtzee, I'm just saying, are you designing a dice game or are you designing a strategy game that happens to use dice for randomness? No mechanic appeals equally to every player, so use your own definition of fun as the ultimate guide. Thanks for watching.